the key challenge seems to be here, what makes a robot human? And of course, to be able to answer that question case by case, you you must have already answered the question, what makes us human? Right? Yeah. I mean, that's, but that's a that's a, a very uh, complex question um, that, you know, was the birth of many, uh, many disparate <laughs> fields of study. Right. I mean, the, the study of humanness is really anthropology, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I mean, it, it yeah, I, it, people haven't even been able to answer, you know, what is humanness? I mean, that's technology's final. I mean, that's 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 the oldest question, humanity's old, oldest question. And, you know, in a way, technology's final question, mm. um, you know, what makes us human? Uh, yeah. and, and that to me is, is, is what deeply interests me, you know, as a, as an anthropologist turned, you know, machine learning, you know, engineering director. Um, it, it's, it's the fun, it's fundamental to everything, I think, um, for me personally. And so, um, yeah. I mean, you and I can talk about this for, for hours, Fabrizio. <laughs> yeah, I always wonder if there's if there's a a childproof answer to these questions because I think once we get to the childproof answer to these questions, we, we actually achieved uh, knowledge in that specific field, and it feels like this is one of the fields in out of the many that still requires so much work. And as you said, mm -hmm. probably the fact that we're working on technology is a sort of discovery process rather than just uh, an evolutionary process. Exactly. And I think, I think, I think there are many different answers, right? I mean, I think, you know, we, we can't, we can't necessarily solve humanness. I mean, that, that presupposes that there is an answer, a single answer. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that's necessarily the correct the correct way to, to go. Um, you know, humanness can be many things um, and is many things. Uh, and so it's, it's just super interesting. Um, yeah, for example, like in, when I was a student at Princeton, um, you know, I, I asked this question to an anthropology professor, uh, very distinguished, um, you know, uh, professor of anthropology, uh, biological anthropology, and he responded, you know, Something that makes us human is the fact that we can contemplate our own death, which I felt was a really <laughs> heavy and interesting response, which was in a way correct, um, but not like the definitive, like a, not a definitive answer, of course, but a really interesting assumption uh, and, and input. So, uh, yeah. Have you, um, I guess you're following Neuralink and the evolution, there's going to be a I believe um, a next event at the end of the month, where they're going to be making some some interesting announcement. Um, what do you think of that kind of uh, work? By the way, sorry, I'm going to close the window because there is an alarm yeah, that's no. going off. One sec. Yeah, no worries. There you go. Yeah, I mean, Neuralink is interesting. I mean, I, I'm curious as to what, you know, the external and internal goals of that project are. I mean, because I know Elon Musk has explained the one of the long term goals, um, obviously, of Neuralink is to, you know, achieve symbiosis with artificial intelligence. Um, as to what that means, um, technically, um, I'm interested in, in learning more about. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, also in terms of adoption, I'm, I'm curious about that because uh, I, I just think it's a privacy security nightmare to, um, yeah, to embed, um, yeah, have that, have that like, from a from read-write perspective. I mean, oh my goodness, I, don't, I, I can't even begin to open up that. This is what I fear uh, about technology in general is that, you know, regardless of what the scope of the objective of the single person is and the moment he makes a discovery, the amount of opportunities and risks it opens up in the moment the discovery is done, it is huge. So yeah. to put it in simple words, you know, by linking up 
uh, a computer to someone's brain, mm -hmm. you might be simply able to uh, cure Tourette syndrome or any kind of mo uh, mental disease. And that would be it, you know, that would be just, we would be happy like that. You know, I don't know what, what the card game is where you, you get a number and you can decide, oh, should I risk and get a higher number or should I keep my number? No, I'll keep them with the ones we have. In that case, I think we should be happy with that. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, this kind of discovery and the technology that they're developing to make this discovery, because let's not forget that they're developing nanotechnologies that are specifically aimed at being able to actually dig into people's brains to get in, into the neurons and actually ignite them when necessary. And to do so, they had to develop a robot that's specifically made to be able to inject those, um, how are they called, uh, uh, anodes, cathodes, wherever they are, into, into the brain. Um, mm -hmm. By doing this discovery, it will open up another opportunity, which is going to be, so the, the number one is solving problems. Okay. And I'll, I'll be happy with that, you know, enhancing, uh, um, solving um, physical and neurological problems. The next stage would be enhancing people's capabilities. And that's where you get into, you know, improve vision, uh, improve memory, upload, download memory, yeah, um, I mean, it, it, it definitely, you know, at, at the very least, it, it you know it represents like Neuralink is a as, as a point in history, you know, represents a really bold first step, I think, towards transhumanism, right? Mm -hmm. um, for for human species, um, I think that that's super interesting. I'm, I am really interested actually in, in seeing this um, this uh, planned uh, planned uh, demo because I think he. I think it's rumored that um, he, you know, he may actually announce human trials at this Neuralink demo. So I'm, I'm curious to see what the roadmap is. Yeah, I'm totally going to see it. And you mentioned this, which is, I think, key, um, transhumanism. And by doing so, it's not going to be a completely new species, but basically we could consider it a new species because then it could be either a human's brain into a robot, or it could be a robot moved by a human brain, or it could be just a human brain and a soul, and it's so uploaded somewhere else. So you could be simultaneously in, in three different places with three different robots, uh, for instance. And what I'm thinking here is, once you're able to do that, you probably solve one of the number one issues that Elon Musk wants to solve with SpaceX, which is making, becoming an interplanetary species. Because with one, you have the, uh, with SpaceX, you have the uh, enabler or transportation method to get somewhere. So another planet. And with the second, you're actually able to extend people's lives to the point or improve it to the point that they're actually able to get there. Because, of course, if it's not Mars, it will have to be some other uh, planet in the whatever belt it's called, the one, uh, um, Goldilocks zone, uh, next to another solar system where the planet is habitable. And uh, this new uh, human machine entity is able to uh, create, uh, just start life again in this new planet. So I'm thinking maybe it's surely not his short term vision, but surely he's considered this as a possibility. Um, well, imagine talking to your 15 year old you. So when you're 15, you upload your memory on your computer, uh, your brain on your computer. And then when you turn 30, you have a chat with yourself when you were 15. That'd be impressive. <laughs> That's a, yeah, that, that would be a <laughs> pretty interesting. Um, I would definitely have, some, I would definitely have a, a one or two things to tell my 15 year old self. Yes. The, unfortunately, 
she wouldn't be able to change anything because she would be in in a in a, in a physical restricted place and she would be evolving to 16 and so on but surely there will be so many things i'll be going back and telling myself no don't do this <laughs> actually to be honest the, because of the way i am there's more the things i ha- the things i regret the most are the things i haven't done rather than the ones i have yeah, that's a that's a regret regret minimization framework. <laughs> yeah. Whenever you're deciding to do something, you gotta do the do the thing that will you know you'll regret the least. Yes, exactly. Um, are there other applications that you think of uh, AI? Except you know we talked about human uh, interaction interface. Uh, we talked about you know how it could be applied into hospitals. We talked about how it could be applied to quality control, um, customer service is definitely one type of thing you're, you're with your oh, com- yeah. company you're looking into because, of course, yeah. it's conversational CRM, it's conversational interfaces. Yes. Um, jobs are definitely going to change uh, mm-hmm. and be revolutionized by this because, of course, it's not just a matter anymore of having you know production chain and the machine substituting the manual work of someone, uh, but now we're we're almost able to create machines that are able to substitute also the um, thoughts and and actions of of someone. So you know if if there if there is any good from this situation, um, you know I I do I do like to, you know I'm an idealist. Um, I do like to look at the good, um, uh, you know, the good side of things. And I do believe it's it's <clears throat> an incredible time to start a new venture. Um, it's, you know, exposing a lot of the inefficiencies and disparities and injustices of, you know, um, American life and, you know, late stage capitalism. And I think, you know, that is good. Um, and I also think that, you know, from an innovation standpoint, you know, a lot of things are moving uh, to to digital today and now, um, and you know, entire entire industries are shifting and changing um, for the good. And I, one way, for for example, one one good outcome that I've personally um, can personally speak to is actually the move to telehealth. I've been really pleasantly surprised about. So before, you know, you. You're, you're sick, you go see a doctor, you have to take time off work. It's a total nightmare. You can't see someone, you have to go in a walk-in clinic. And um, I, I just as a very, very particular specific example, just even the movement to you know telehealth-based solutions, I think for um, personalized health care and patient services, I think is really good. Um, yeah. But but yeah, you know, I, I do like to look at the good, the good side of things. And I think um, there's no better time to start start new things, start new ventures, um, you know, change, change rigid um, systems that don't work. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, do do good, right? That's the that's the end goal. Yeah, there's those systems are locked into the old way of old fashioned way of thing, old fashioned way of uh, doing things. And uh, because they couldn't do anything, <laughs> because of lockdown, they had to completely reinvent themselves. So with, with telemedicine, I'm, I actually agree with you, 100 percent if not more because we had the same experience with um with our son um and it was really helpful but then on the other side also what i'm thinking is what we're talking about is basically differential diagnosis which is something a computer could do way better than a human being in many situations um so i was talking to a friend of mine who's um oh sorry the same i was mentioning before so the urologist sometimes mm-hmm. when he's on a i don't know how you call it on a call so he's available uh, in case there's an emergency so he's at home he's 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 got his phone next to him and if it rings he has to go there he said 90 yeah. percent of the times he rushes to the hospital and the things he's rushed to the hospital for doesn't require surgery and could have been solved just by knowing what the issue is. Because sometimes they, you know, the doctors are there; they're not experts. They're they're maybe young, and they just panic and they call their uh, yeah. the older one who's available. Yeah. Um, in that situation, it will be as simple as having an AI who 
breathing uh, uh, most sorry most of the cases he said when he goes there in the hospital it's just about it's just a matter of um how do you say um it's like diagnosis the, yeah it's the diagnosis but also selecting the right treatment with the right mm -hmm. dosage yeah and that's where he, he, his input is required and he's like an ai based on the diagnosis could easily and and the uh, you know basic um uh, uh, information about the client, oh, the the customer. Sorry, customer. <laughs> See, that's, that's deviation from my work. Uh, the patient. Um, you could easily um, identify what what the proportions and what the um, mixture should be between the um, uh, how they call drugs that you have to to give to the patient. So an mm -hmm. AI could do all of that. Easily, and I and I don't and I don't think this would remove you know human oversight. Like I think you would. I think what what would be great and and would actually um, remove a lot of the inefficiencies of of like the workflow itself is you know perhaps you know a machine learning based system makes a recommendation um, based on like an image of a mole that could be cancerous. And then dispatches that to you know. Um, yeah, and the doctor to, could to see it from, from home, home on the phone yeah. via the app, yeah. and then approve or disapprove or not approve. Or because exactly. the thing is, exactly. when he rushes to the hospital, apart from the stress of rushing at two o'clock in, in in the evening at night uh, to the hospital for something that could have been solved easily on the phone, he's also paid four times as much. I know it's ridiculous. So it's also a cost I mean, for the hospital. So this is actually a business case for an hospital. What we're talking about, mainly. Yeah. 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 But yeah. Anyway, we we touched on AI, so we we can finally open up on the discussion on that subject too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we we uh, we just jammed for the <laughs> for the first forty minutes. Of this call. <laughs> Um, so just for everybody who's listening then to to know we, we actually met uh through linkedin i think you got in touch uh more than a year ago and yeah more than, more than a year ago oh my goodness when i yeah when i was uh in my former life when i was working in a humanoid robotics lab that was interesting yeah. that actually was uh impressive when i saw it and i was like hugely impressed because it's um a subject I'm always been interested in, but never had the chance to deepen. And it, right in that mm -hmm. moment, I had like a bit of spare time to actually start working on projects that are, were a bit more of, let's say, um, envisioning uh, mm -hmm. the future in, in, in my business. And so uh, I was like, oh, that's actually a perfect match because we had this, uh, we still have actually this problem of, uh, you know, quality control on mm -hmm. um, and pattern recognition on uh, on on fabric in our case and it's uh it's a huge year yearly cost and it's something that we do manually it's, we've got resources dedicated to it there's always mistakes there's no data no 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 coherent database with all the information we need and so on and that's where uh, we started talking because i was looking for a solution for someone mm -hmm. to support in defining a solution uh mm -hmm. for transforming this quality control into something that was managed by uh, artificial intelligence with uh, visual recognition, yeah. basically. Yeah. And that's, that's a really, I mean, you know, machine assisted uh, quality control for, um, for pattern, uh, pattern, uh, I guess, pattern QA, um, mm -hmm. you know, for garment stuff is a really, really applicable um, uh, use case for computer vision. Um, yeah. It's super, super, super doable. Um, it can, you know, be deployed directly on the the spool itself, the the mechanical spool that you guys have spinning mm -hmm. the fabric to, you know, where you have human operators queuing the the pattern itself um, against the original print um, or reference. But yeah, that's and, and that, so that's how we met. Um, and and now um, it's interesting because since we last talked and since I actually came over came out came out to um to microsoft uh, milan to to present um at at your innovation yeah. uh kind of conference which was really interesting um i actually have moved on to a, a new company yeah um, so i always joke that you know i i went from uh the world of physical humanoid robots to now digital humanoids <laughs> <laughs> um and i'm actually a company uh, it's really so it's kind of hilarious but, 
I know, Soul Machines. Yeah, so I'm at a really cool company um, called Soul Machines. We make uh, digital humans. You know, we're, we just closed a $40 million Series B um, from lead investors like Temasek and Lake, Lake Star and Salesforce. Uh, but but in, in my company, um, I actually lead a team of uh, NLP engineers, so kind of AI AI engineers and uh, conversation designers to on the on the delivery side um, mm. to implement digital human uh, projects for Fortune 50 clients. So um, after the deal is signed, my team kind of uh, wrangles delivery and um, and the success of these these projects, which is which is really fun. So what do you so the the, the common thread there between your this experience and your previous one, where you you were basically uh, building humanoids. Um, mm -hmm. Is this um, human machine interaction? Let's call it yes. interface. Yes, exactly. Um, it's, it's, I, I, yeah, that's exactly right, actually, because um, so in my previous role, I was, you know, director of human robot interaction um, in, in a R and D kind of lab. And now I'm, you know, on the commercial side. Um, thinking about the space between humans and machines. And I think that space is really fun. It's a really fun space to be in because you essentially get to think about, you know, building interfaces um, between minds. And sometimes, you know, the minds are human minds and to machine minds. Sometimes the minds are entire organizations. Um, sometimes the minds are, you know, teams. Um, so it's a really interesting space um, to dwell in and to develop solutions for. You know, I'm thinking, I was thinking about, you know, thinking of artificial intelligence. And the one, one thing that came into my mind is one question that I could have asked you was, you know, how do you see this evolving in the next years? But we are always, as a society, affected by the, vi the, the image of, of AI, something like, Skynet, uh, or <laughs> this this omni pre this god godish kind of of presence uh, of intelligence that we created and then got out of control, and I think mm -hmm. that's scary, uh, possible, unlikely, um, and I think what should really what would really be helpful for people to understand what AI is uh, is actually focusing on needs. And how these, this technology, like any other technology, can improve either our experiences. So, you know, think of it as technology enabling solutions, such as I don't know, Hubble telescope allowing us to look deeper into space and therefore understanding mm -hmm. our universe in a better way. Mm -hmm. uh, such a think of antennas and radars that allow us to hear things we couldn't hear with our own ear, um, what's it called? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I get what you're saying. And I think, I think what, one of the most like intellectual, you know, intellectually interesting, um, you know, in, endeavors about what I'm doing now um, that I kind of did in my previous role too, but not, not as much as, as currently at Soul Machines is, um, you know, because we're a company, I mean, we're an AGI company. Um, so we're a company that does, you know, deep R&D and scientific research um, on artificial general intelligence, um, but we make digital humans. And so what that to me um, is a really a question about or a pursuit of is, you know, humanizing computing, mm. which is a really like really interesting thing um, because then you get to think about, you know, what happens when, you know, computing, surfaces or computing interfaces um, become human or human-like or start to look like us. Um, and that opens up, you know, a wide, a huge can of worms, obviously. Um, but, you know, in the commercial sense, what, what really kind of gets me off as well is, you know, I work with huge companies um, where we, you know, create custom digital human solutions um, for, and you could kind of read, you know, all over, you know, all of the stuff that we, we have on our website. But, um, it, you know, it's quite it's quite an interesting pursuit because you get to think about you know what happens like how do you personify organizations because organizations are, and companies are you know a cybernetic collection of you know machines and people and processes and um, ideologies and products 
you know, how do you personify that? How do you, how do you encode that in a digital human, in a person that, you know, can, can engage with users or solve business, you know, business so it's, issues? It's a, it's a strategic a and, a, and a creative challenge, first and foremost, the fields. Totally, totally. So, and so. You, I really urge you, I really urge you to kind of, and these are my personal viewpoints, of course, uh, you know, on the on what I find interesting. Um, but I, you know, we we actually just completely redid um, our website with a bunch of use cases and verticals. And, I'm gonna look into you know, them. If you're interested in them. Yeah, I think you should really look into them because they're super. In, you know, we've we've partnered with huge companies like you know P and G uh, and SK two and a bunch of others. And it's, it's kind of an interesting um, foray into the world of, of digital humans. So I urge you to uh, check out our website and check out, of our, check out our origin stories as well. It's quite, quite interesting. Will do, Note, noted. Um, it feels like, yeah, it, it is a, a strategic and creative challenge, and then it becomes a technological challenge afterwards. But the first thing is defining, you know, what the tone of the company is and how, how, how do they want to reflect that tone into the way they communicate to customers? And then mm -hmm. and follow, and the following is, uh, you know, is it a female? Is it a man? Is it both? Uh, is it, mm -hmm. uh, is it everything? Is it, um, it, is it blue? Is it white? Is it black? Is it, mm -hmm. how does it resonate? How do we make it resonate as much as possible with the audience that normally would engage with that kind of technology or inter interface? Because of course, if, if it's in Japan, it would be, it would talk and act in a certain way. And actually, by the way, I think there's no better place in, on earth to be out of earth than in Japan in terms of how it's, it's such a, a parallel universe that has developed with its own rules and, uh, yeah. and society. Uh, mm -hmm. Even though, unfortunately, it's almost distinguished because of, they don't have sex. But anyway. Um, <laughs> no comment on that. <laughs> the, you know, it's a shame. Um, but the, the thing mm -hmm. is, oh, it has to resonate with, with whoever is going to engage with it. So if you're thinking about building a robot, you know, it, it might be scary for one society if it's done in a certain way. And then it might be friendly if it's done in a certain way for a different society. And the same thing happens, of course, with, uh, with a digital interface and a digital um, mm -hmm. avatar, call it like that. This is definitely going to disrupt also the job industry. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is also going to open up new job opportunities on the other side, all together with the technological advances and the discoveries that are going to come with AI being used to increase computational power uh, when we're doing scientific discoveries. So maybe we're going to be able to look deeper into space, as I mentioned before, um, mm -hmm. or uh, build new materials because uh, the... Uh, AI is actually able to calculate things uh, way more quickly and better than we do. Mm -hmm. um, so society is definitely in the next 50 years going to change a lot. Uh, and I'm wondering, what's, what's your gut feeling in terms of what would you recommend a younger version of yourself getting into, uh, you know, getting their diploma and starting university? What could be a useful uh, kind of study field uh, in this scenario? Yeah, I think um, I hesitate to, you know, say one thing or another because I fundamentally believe, you know, anyone should pursue what they're interested in. Um, however, as well, um, one thing that might be beneficial is, I mean, from my personal experience is, you know, I, I really do wish um, I took coding, coding classes or data science classes, or at the very least, uh, statistics uh, courses at, at Princeton when I was there, I actually pivoted into software development after university, mm. which was really late. Um, but, but at the same time, you know, I was really interested in this, in this question of humanness. And I couldn't be where I am today without, you know, having been uh, an anthropology major who later pivoted into data scientists, a uh, data science uh, later in, you know, their career. So I think, you know, I, I really urge, you know, younger, younger folks to, to start coding. Um, then, um, but also to couple that um, hard engineering computer science um, experience with, 
you know, multivalent interests, like, you know, maybe dance, maybe it's performance, maybe it's cooking, maybe it's physics, um, whatever you're interested in, um, you know, go for it. Um, Reminds me of this you know, um, a graph. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's an interviewer or myself who drew it during an interview. I'm trying to remember. Anyway, it's uh, it's it's just two circles that intersect, uh, and on one side there's what you study. Oh, so there's three circles that intersect, and on one side there is what you studied. The other side is the experiences you have at work, and the other one is your hobbies, your passions. Mm-hmm. And, and and the sweet spot between those three is actually what is your added value when you're hired, yeah. yes. um, or what makes the difference when you come up with ideas that no one else has come up with. Uh, and definitely, I think what you just said made me think that that probably makes a lot of sense, and it it it, it should be the case. And if anything, if is probably making sure that whoever is growing up and your your help you're raising is. Mm-hmm. Um, his brain is flexible enough to be able to embrace as many fields and hobbies and passions as possible. Of course, so that, yeah. And I, yeah. And just to go off that, you know, I think, you know, fundamentally what, what engineering really teaches you to do is to, you know, uh, it gives you the agency to bring to life your ideas. And I think that is a very, very powerful toolkit um, and, you know, we're, we're now in an age where you can pretty much learn anything, um, you know, from the internet. Totally agree um, with you. Yeah. It, it, you don't necessarily need to go to school. <laughs> in fact, that might be a deterrent <laughs> from really, uh, you know, allowing your mind to wander. Uh, I think Google just announced that they have this, uh, university degree that they, they yeah, I saw that. It was awesome. It, it should last like a couple of months rather than three years. So it's yeah. Im- imagine you, you could get five of these highly specialized degrees um, yeah. Yeah. and actually be able to make way more of, of it and of the time you saved, uh, yeah. out of the time you saved than the three years spasmodically yeah. spent uh, on the books in, in yeah. a university. I know a lot of people wouldn't agree with me because they keep saying that, you know, all going to it's it's uh, the interaction with other people and so on and i agree with that side of things too the sh- social aspect of university is really important uh but the knowledge itself uh these days really there's youtube tutorials about anything basically i could start yeah. um crafting knives tomorrow exactly with watching exactly. three three videos Maybe yeah, badly, I mean, example, <laughs> <laughs> but I would still start. And then, you know, all, the, the rest will be experience, of course. Exactly. I mean, for example, I last night I was kind of um, stuck on YouTube uh, late watching how to make hargao, which is, you know, basically Chinese shrimp dumplings. <laughs> <laughs> so to give you some idea of how random and uh, deep you can go. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's the beauty of, you know, but imagine, you know, 50 years ago, you wouldn't even think about, well, first of all, you would yeah. probably wouldn't even know what Chinese dumplings are, uh, but a few people would have gone to restaurant to, to a Chinese restaurant anyway. Um, but there would be no way to actually be able to do that if not engaging directly with a Chinese person. It's, Which it's, still it's, would uh, be interesting and fun. And I think it's part of the experiences, like Airbnb experiences. That was a, a, a cool project that they launched uh, a year ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, an ex-boss of mine, Musa, uh, worked on it. Um, oh, and that's, uh, th- that's definitely something interesting. But as you said, it's, um, it's, it's there. It's five minutes of video and you're done. You, you know what it needs to be done. Then, you know, doing it. And again, as I said, uh, being good at it it's it's we get into the 1000 hour rule which i think is <laughs> is is a very valid rule that you have to do something 1000 hours before you can claim you're an expert in that yeah i think i think it's 10000 no, yeah 10000 oh yes makes more sense the, the genius uh, metric there's um a friend of mine i talked to recently um by the way can you hear me well absolutely yeah, yeah i can hear you um, a friend of mine who's a urologist, he's a doctor, yeah. Um, 
we talked about this, um, you know, the spreading of the virus, and he made this really interesting comparison. He said, this is a dangerous virus because normally the worst viruses we as humans know, such as Ebola and things like that, are actually less dangerous because they're so lethal that they end up killing the entire uh, village it, it originates from before it spreads across villages. So, yeah. so it's, it's, it's almost a silly virus. Yeah, I know. And that's, that's interesting because the r naught of COVID is way um, less than that of Ebola. Um, but it's, yeah, I mean, there, there was a whole bunch of reasons why it was just so mishandled. I mean, you couldn't even get a test if you're, you know, exhibiting, you know, three out of five of the COVID symptoms in, you know, early on in, in, in you know, major cities like New York. Um, I, I, I heard, you know, horror stories from a number of my friends where they were, you know, basically turned away um, from, from testing centers because they only exhibited, you know, fevers. <laughs> Uh, which is like just absolutely ridiculous. Um, so I, I, I mean, yeah, there, there are a bunch of reasons, but I think, um, I think, you know, in the wake of everything, um, there's, there's been a real um, social uprising that I think is, is extremely important um, just in the way, you know, just in the, the, the mishandling of, of many, many things. I mean, COVID is just a metaphor for, you know, many, many different things um, kind of under the iceberg, you know, under the water. Um, so, yeah, it's just it's amazing how much people are blinded to these things, though, because when I was watching the briefings from the White House, so Dr. Fauci and Trump and so on, and it, it almost felt like a circus <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and it was uh, fun in a bad way uh, to, mm -hmm. to watch, entertaining, surely. Um, and I kept wondering how, if I'm, you know, this horrified by what's being said at the moment and how stupid the things that are being said are, uh, how can someone who's a citizen, voting citizen in the U.S. accept that? And how could the majority be okay with that? Like, why, why isn't he kicked out of the White House the day after he says the first stupid thing he said? Um, you know, not to mention also the UV thing about injecting yourself and things like that. Like, it, it's gone to a level where nowadays, now we're, we're basically become immune and 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 deaf yeah. to to what, what is being said. But he says in every single interview so many stupid things that I don't really understand how someone who's heading a government can actually be, uh, first of all, allowed to say such things without paying consequences, mm -hmm. considering mm -hmm. the huge effects that things that someone of his level has on society as a whole. So um, mm -hmm. this com this just confirms what we, we said earlier, which is, it's just a stupid society. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah. it reminds me of this movie, um, Waking Life, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there's a... Oh, yeah, I love, I love that movie. You, you must have been given your, your background. Uh, there's the scene in which there's uh, the guy at the bar talking with that old man and they're talking about Greek philosophers and Nietzsche afterwards and they're saying, um, the old man is saying, you know, you, you shouldn't be surprised uh, that we as a society have, haven't evolved, haven't built anything better than how society was structured in, uh, in Greece uh, more than 2,000 years ago because... Um, Basically, what he, he says is the distance between Nietzsche uh, and any high-level human and the average human is way bigger than the distance between the average human and the common chimpanzee. Uh, mm -hmm. So what he's saying there is, you know, if you're putting people to vote uh, and you're allowing people to vote, and I'm not, you know, I don't want to be the... Um, dictatorial kind of point of view, and, and I don't have that. I don't have a point of view on the subject. I'm just saying that it, it is definitely a good observation that if most people are misinformed and most people vote, there's always going to be uh, the, the result is always going to be something that's not necessarily useful for society and positive. 
Yeah, and I think, um, I don't know, I think the pa pandemic was almost just, it was kind of, kind of like a, a stage in which, you know, the, the absurdities of late stage capitalism <laughs> really came to light. I mean, you know, speaking of what you just mentioned and um, with, you know, every time, you know, Trump spoke publicly, there was some, you know, um, problem or um, uh, incorrect, you know, informative thing he said. I mean, we're now we're now living in a in a period where we have to question the information we read. I mean, that that is just such an absurd, um, surreal time. I mean, with like the advent of fake news, I mean, it, it's just it, it's insane. Um, and yeah, so, I don't even trust left left information. Like when I read something from well, a less same, right? newspaper, it's I'm, I'm still, even though I should be happy that I'm what I'm of, about what I'm reading. It's sometimes it's so absurd. Myself, I'm asking, okay, this is fun, and I'm happy this is happening. But actually, is this true? Let me double check. And sometimes I'm amazed by the fact that actually, even even the newspapers that should be giving me the news I want to hear. Uh, they're they're making me doubt about the truth and what's really what really matters is in the end is that I know there isn't any and there isn't an objective truth that you can find in the end, especially when it comes down to politics. But reading data, that shouldn't be questionable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it's like mm -hmm. the you know the interview Trump had with I don't remember which which uh, uh, newspaper it was with, but it, it's just recent in which they were uh, he was counting the deaths compared to the positives and they said you should count the deaths compared to and the journalist was saying you should count the deaths compared to uh the population of the country because that gives you a comparable number first and then it gives you a better idea of how lethal the uh, or lethal or dangerous the virus is or what the situation really is and so mm -hmm. again it's it's about you know sometimes it's uh, it's just about reading data in a different way but again it's we're talking about numbers come on how can you twist numbers and how can people not understand that like it's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how, how we, 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 to the in 2020 people should be risen through school to a level in which they should be like me able to discern or at least question at least 50 percent of stuff they're, they're served through newspapers news and uh and social media but it's not the case we're lazy no. and that's another quote yeah. from uh <laughs> from um from waking life we're, we're, we're incredibly yeah. lazy yeah and i i mean it's you know it's internal bias right i mean we want we ultimately want to believe what we want to believe um and um yeah i mean it's interesting people have built hedge funds around you know um betting on <laughs> betting on outcomes that people don't want to uh believe are true <laughs> and doing very well <laughs> on that so it's it's kind of interesting but let, let me ask let me ask you a question um because you're in a really interesting position um being in kind of you know the epicenter of you know the the western birth of of COVID and then seeing, you know, uh, the situation unfold um, horribly in the U.S. You know, what is your opinion of things? Um, it's so you know, silly being, to see yeah. that you had someone burn itself on, on a flame and you're doing the exact same thing right after. Like yeah. uh, when it came to the U.K. and I had so many friends I was chatting, you know, we lived in London for a few years, me and my wife. Yeah. Um, and I was chatting with my UK friends, updating them and saying, guys, it's coming over there. I, like, if, if it's here, it means it's been here for four or five months and we're yeah. realizing it now. And if it's been here for four or five months, it means that it's been everywhere already since four or five months. So, yeah. so it's not a matter of if it will happen to you, but when it will happen. So, you know, start uh, adopting these hygiene uh, which basic hygiene uh, rules that I think are one of the positives of COVID is they, they've really uh, taught us how to wash our hands and uh, be, be care and, and not go and visit our grandparents if we're sick and we've mm -hmm. got a flu, you know, basic things, but they're, they're really useful. And so, you know, start following these rules and be prepared, brace yourself because it's coming. And, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm I feel saying like it's that, been 
it's been bimodal, right? It's it's really you know allowed people to you know take value and and refuge in the the sanctity of 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 human life, but also you know in another you know weird dark manifestation, you know I just see other people becoming like hyper individualistic and not caring and you know just disregarding you know. I don't even know. It's just, I really feel like it's bimodal. It's just bizarre. It's, um, I think it's wrong. It's wrong because, so if we were really in a life threatening situation, but like a post apocalyptic situation, I would understand egoism in that situation in which you're thinking about your family and that's it. Even though it would be a situation in which collectively we should be thinking about the progression of the human species rather than our family and our small group. But anyway, I would still understand that, but since we're not there yet, that selfishness of doing, you know, fuck it, holiday to Croatia costs 50% less than it cost last year, so this year I'm going to Croatia. And I've, we've gone out of lockdown one week ago. That, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's not, that's not the, that, that's wrong. So that's where I, I agree with you and it's, it's completely out of control and it's brought up sides of human behavior um, that I'm not happy with, that I'm happy they've came out because maybe there's going to be moments in which gonna be, we're going to be looking back and confronting them, hopefully when things get better. Um, but it's hard to tell. And the other thing is... In all this situation, then you look at the U.S. and you see what's happening with the police and the minorities. Uh, well, call them minorities. They're not minorities probably anymore. Um, I mean, that's not even new. Like, this is nothing new. I think, you know, you know, the social, you know, the, the social movement, which is really an uprising against police brutality in America, this is nothing new. I mean, it's just now we're at the, you know, precipice of, of a lot of social and economic disorder um, and people can't take it because frankly, you know, underrepresented um, Americans, you know, especially minorities, um, you know, are actually dying two to three times the rate of, you know, more privileged white, you know, uh, non <laughs> uh, minority individuals. So it's, 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 it's people, it's ridiculous, you know. And if you and were in, in 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 a in a working so in a in a normally working society, you'd be questioning that that and saying, "Well, why they have access to the same kind of services?" And well, in the U.S., is not the case. So that's no, it isn't. No. that's 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 probably one of the reasons is also be, because of how inaccessible health is in, in in the U.S., which is a common right instead. And I mean, there's just so many things, right? Like systemic racism that's just gone on, you know, and it, it, it's just, it's a whole other conversation, but um, 